If you have your Bibles, please turn them to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. If you have, are using the Pew Bible, you can go to page 939. Romans 1, 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. This morning, we want to just pause and reflect in a unique way today on the story of the gospel. We have been talking a lot in our previous Sundays about our role as being ambassadors of Christ and ministers of reconciliation in our communities and how we share the gospel. And what I want to do just for a few moments, and then we're going to actually do some more singing again, as I want us to pause and reflect on the beauty of the story of the gospel. So you, if you'd allow me in just a few moments, I would like to retell this story. First, the gospel is fundamentally something that has been given to us. It's not something we make. It's not something we create. It's not something we can think of. It's been something, it's something that has been given to us. So we want to celebrate what has been given to us. The love of God embodied in the gospel of God. The gospel is essentially God's work on our behalf. And so the story of the gospel was imagined, initiated, and carried out by God. The gospel is essentially the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But what is important for us to identify is the foundation of the gospel. What compelled God to imagine? What compelled God to initiate? What compelled God to carry out the story of the gospel? Love. Love is what compelled God to imagine, initiate, and carry out this story. Love is what compelled God even to create the world. The work of the gospel is essentially seen through the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see that Paul in Acts 14, the scene is that they... Paul and Barnabas approach a man that has not been able to walk from birth. And so Paul and Barnabas become the means through which God heals this man to be able to walk again. And so the priests and priestesses of the community there, of the pagan worshipers, start believing that Paul and Barnabas must be Zeus and Hermes in flesh, must be God in flesh And so Paul and Barnabas, you can imagine, are very upset about this. And so they're, I mean, imagine the scene of this happening, and the priests and priests, they're bringing relics out to Paul and Barnabas to worship them, and Paul's screaming back, ripping his clothes, and he's saying, no, no, we are not the gods. He said, I come to bring you the good news. I come to bring you the gospel. And he says, there is a living creator God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And we see there that Paul finds it essentially important that when we think of the good news, when we think of the gospel, we must begin that God created the world. 
that there is a living creator God. But this is not a living creator God who spun the world into existence and then from there forward looked disinterested at the world that he created. No, the very love that compels and is the foundation for the gospel is the same love that compelled God to create. What compelled God not only to carry out the work of the gospel, but let's ask the same question about creation. What compelled God to imagine and initiate and carry out the creation of the world? It was love. God is love. And everything that came into being, from the stars, to the sun, to the moon, to the land, to the animals, to the sea, to humanity, all is an expression of love. What do trees reveal to us about the divine nature of God, that God is love? What do our human interactions and need for each other reveal about the divine nature, that God is love? What do the seas reveal to us about the divine God, that God is love? And so God's expression of his own being is that he is love, and the way he imagined and desired to express his love is in the creation that we live in and are a part of. But as we know, the creation experienced a brutal and fatal flaw. We see that Genesis 5 inserts a new reality for humanity. There's a repeated phrase in Genesis 5. The phrase is, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Death entered through the sin of humanity. And so God, though, in his love, God is love. In God's love, he promised to never walk away from his creation. And so the gospel the gospel is the reality that God is committed to loving his creation. The foundation of creation and the gospel is love. And when we share the gospel, when we share this gospel, we celebrate the gospel, when we sing about the gospel, when we pray for the spread of the gospel, we are one for one sharing, celebrating, singing, and praying about the love of God. Creation is an expression of God's love, but the gospel is the masterpiece of God's love expressed in the world. And so we see that we must start with the story of the gospel, with the reality that there is a loving, living creator God. We also see, though, that the good news, as foretold in the Old Testament, Imagine this living, loving creator God reigning. So we see in Isaiah 52, where it says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And what is the good news that they're bringing? The good news that they're bringing is that your God reigns. Now, if any of us just take a moment of reflection to wonder, is that actually good news? I mean, how often... Has it actually been executed that another king is going to be good news for the world? I mean, how many times have we actually been like, man, I'm so glad this new king is reigning? It's mostly been predominantly when human beings are reigning, been oppressive and bad for the world. So why wouldn't God choose to bring good news and his love to the world in a fundamentally different way than reigning? Reigning has usually been bad for us. Why all of a sudden is it going to be good for us? Well, we have to ask our question, what kind of king will he be? Could there be a good king? We see a little hint of what this king will be like, actually at beginning at the end of chapter 52 in Isaiah, going into 53, when we see the suffering servant. By his stripes, we are healed. How many kings of the world can you say, by his stripes, we are healed? 
And so we have to ask ourselves, what kind of king is this going to be? Well, as we continue the story of the gospel, not just around the living creator God who will reign and his will to carry this out, but we also see the story of the gospel and the work of the gospel continued through how God manifests this reign in the world. And God particularly manifests and expresses his reign in the world through Jesus of Nazareth. Paul tells us about Jesus, that he was in the form of God, equal with God, the very nature of God. But Paul says about this Jesus that is going to be God's king for the world is that he didn't see his equality with God as a matter of grasping and taking, but he saw his equality with God as a matter of giving. So when God is reflected through Jesus, his very nature, it's fundamentally in giving up. And so we see in giving up, the Son of God from all eternity assumes flesh. The Son of God doesn't come as a grown man trying to avoid all the pains of adolescence and just become in the world as a grown adult. But because it's a matter of solidarity and giving, this king comes into the world just like every one of us. Through the connected by an umbilical cord body of a woman. Jesus experienced being cut from his mother by the umbilical cord being cut. He experienced nursing from his mother. This is, as the Hebrew writer says, this king became like us in every respect. What it meant for Jesus to reveal to us the nature of God was to become like us in every respect, as the writer of Hebrew also says, so that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. We have a sovereign king that refuses to rule and reign creation without sympathizing with our weaknesses. He refuses to sit on a throne until he understands all the tragedy and complexities of our weakness and brokenness. And so he's born into the world and grew just like every one of us. He dwelt among us. And so as this humble king comes into the world, we see as he lived as an adult, that he left 99 just for one. That he welcomed and healed the outsiders. That he loved his enemies. That he ran toward his rebellious child. He fed the hungry. He treated women with dignity. He said, don't be anxious. He chose a donkey for his triumphal entry. He washed feet, and he died for our sins. And for those that continued to betray him all the way to the cross, he welcomed them back. Peter. There's no greater love than one who will lay his life down for his friend. Jesus laid his life down for us. And so, as the final expression... That Jesus did not see his being in the image of God as a matter of demanding and taking. He saw his being made as the very nature of God, as a matter of giving up, even to the point of death on a cross. But the gospel is not good news if this sovereign king, as humble as he was and as loving as he was, remained dead. So we see in the story of the gospel that the father brings the son back from the dead. Jesus is raised and is vindicated by his father. And he now, in this new resurrected life, desires to share life with us. But a conceived Jesus alone is not good enough news. An infant Jesus is not good enough news. A miracle-working Jesus is not good enough news. 
The sacrificial death of Jesus is not good enough news. Even a resurrected Jesus is not good enough news. Otherwise, Lazarus would have done the job. An ascended Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father who went through the body of a woman and sacrificed his life is the proclamation that the gospel is very good. We need a sovereign king that is not going to float around as a ghost in some ethereal world. We need a sovereign king that is going to return to creation with justice and righteousness and rule and fix us and our world. This is good news. But if Jesus remained... The life of the Father, Son, and Spirit would be contained in the localized presence of Jesus. And so we would probably, 2,000 years later, still be waiting for Jesus to go from town to town sharing the life of God. That would take a while. And so Jesus says to his disciples, I'm serious when I say to you, it is better that I leave. Because the triune life and love that exists between me and the Father, Son, and Spirit will be yours if I leave. Because he breathed on them the breath of God. He breathed on them the Spirit and says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So that as those who believe in and follow Jesus, we are now the localized presence of God in creation. The Spirit of God indwells us to be temples of love for the world. The good news of the gospel extends to the work of the Spirit. God has always had a localized presence in the world, not just his omnipresence, but also a localized presence in the Garden of Eden, in the pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, in the tabernacle, in the temple, and then in Jesus, as it says, that he tabernacled among us, John says, and then... As Jesus dies, resurrects from the dead, ascends back to his Father's throne, sends the Spirit from the throne to all who believe in him to dwell in them. So that as we worship together this morning, we worship united in one Spirit. This is the gospel. The gospel essentially includes the work of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The gospel was initiated by God, was imagined by God, was carried out by God. The gospel is completely contingent upon his power and his power in love. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave, for God so loved that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not need to perish, but have everlasting life, both imminently and forever. So at this point, we're going to continue singing. The gospel is not something just for you to sit and listen to me talk about. The gospel is something for us to celebrate, to praise, to express. It's not just a set of ideas for us to think about. It's not just a set of ideas to argue about. The gospel is not just a set of laws for us to obey. The gospel is a story of the living creator God who lives in us today, who is uniting us to him. And after a few songs... I'll come back to talk more about the fruit of the gospel as we continue to celebrate. The gospel bears fruit. Fruit that is for us to eat. It produces life-giving, delicious, life-sustaining fruit. When we as a church practice baptism, it is an expression of our belief that what happened to Jesus happens to us. That as Jesus died and resurrected, so as we die, we also will be brought back to life. 
restored body and soul in the new creation and the resurrection of the dead. And we groan with all creation waiting for that day of redemption. When we take the Lord's table and we eat and we drink, every time we eat and we drink, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. And the fruit of the gospel is not only the love of God penetrating each and every one of your individual lives, the fruit of the gospel also creates community. The gospel would not be good news if it left us as human beings to ourselves with just us and God. It's not how he designed us. It's not how he's wired us. He's wired us for him, and by wiring us in him, he's wired us to each other. And so the fruit of the gospel in baptism and the Lord's Supper is a collection and a new creation of the new community, the body of Christ, a habitat for love. This is the church, the fruit of the gospel, the habitat of love, and our calling is initially and first and foremost to love each other, be kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And so our calling is to welcome those outside of the church into the church, showing them the same love. And the final fruit of new creation, final fruit of the gospel, will be the new creation. The new heavens, the new earth. When it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, but we're all the bride of Christ, adorned for the groom as the groom comes back to restore creation and to fix all the brokenness the world has given to us. I don't know what your life has brought you. Many don't feel like they've earned the love of God because of things they've done. Many feel they don't deserve the love of God because of what has been done to them. But the love of God penetrates through all of our actions that we have done and penetrates through all the actions that have been done to us. If you have never received the love of Christ, the love of God, today is a day of salvation. All your sins can be forgiven. And God, through the Spirit, will start making you new. We need to continue singing because this is good news. <laughs>